So I uh, wrote a book that came out a couple of months ago. It's called Drift. It's had pretty good reviews. It was number one on the New York Times bestseller list for more than a month, which was amazing and weird. Uh, it's been great. It's, it's getting reviewed in the Washington Post this weekend, which I'm all nervous about. Um, but all in all, it's, I mean, it's good, right? The idea of writing a book is even when people disagree with the case that you make, I mean, the whole reason I wrote it is so people would at least pay attention to that case that I'm making, at least argue about it. And the basic idea of this book that I wrote is that we go to war now in a way that isn't the way the Constitution says we are supposed to. And that isn't how we have done it in the past. War for us now sort of drifted into a way that we have war in our country now in a way that is really insulated both from our politics and from civilian life. It doesn't affect us here at home. It is slick and painless for us who are not fighting these wars. And in some cases, we actually do not know that we are at war in the sense that we are not told by our own government that we are doing it. Take, for example, a nice Friday night news dump from a couple of weeks ago, Friday, June 15th. The president sends a letter to Congress, the president has to do this every six months, explaining where our troops are in the world and under what legal authority they are there. So this latest one says we are out of Iraq entirely. It says we are still fighting in Afghanistan, quote, actively pursuing and engaging remaining Al-Qaeda and Taliban fighters in Afghanistan. It says we're still running Guantanamo. Uh, which is in Cuba, which is awkward for so many reasons. It says we've got those troops in Central Africa going after Joseph Kony and the Lord's Resistance Army. It says we've got military monitors in Kosovo left over from 1999 and in Egypt left over from 1981. Although, boy, howdy, is Egypt different now than it was in 1981. But you know what it does not mention anywhere is this place where we are definitely at war, but we don't call it that. For nine years, the U.S. has been killing people using remote piloted aircraft in the nuclear-armed, fairly unstable, rapidly anti-American nation of Pakistan. President Bush started this policy, but President Obama has tripled down on it. Now, we know we are doing it. The Obama administration did finally admit to the fact that we are doing this in year nine of the policy just last month. They admitted to it in a speech by the president's counterterrorism advisor, John Brennan. But here's the thing about this policy. Nobody ever gets to see that it's happening. And not just in the normal way that we as civilians don't get to see the war fighting that US troops do in other countries. No, in Pakistan, it's something even more than that. There aren't embedded reporters riding along somehow with the drone pilots. The tribal areas where this is happening are explicitly off limits to Westerners, including Western reporters. I know from experience how hard it is to get a visa to cover Pakistan at all as a Western reporter, but to go to report on the impact of the drone strikes in the places where the drone strikes are, the answer is no. And that's why this exclusive report that we've got tonight, which has never been seen anywhere before, is so critically important and so fascinating. This is an exclusive, very, very hard to get footage from something that almost no outsider has ever seen. Watch this. This is what many Pakistanis call evidence of an American war with their country. Rare images from the remote tribal region of North Waziristan showing destruction after a U.S. drone strike. The attack occurred at 3 a.m. on March 30th in this market area. One missile pierced the ceiling. More demolished five nearby shops. Four alleged militants were killed in this strike. Their identities were never publicly confirmed. Here in the border region with Afghanistan, strikes like this are not uncommon. But the area hardest hit by the drones is also the most difficult for outsiders to visit or report from. The collateral damage is way more than what it is even perceived by the people who are doing it. Pakistani lawyer Shazad Akbar says he's discovered that while the U.S. drone campaign may yield a few high-value hits, far more civilians are being killed than are reported. Over 300 strikes have been carried out in Pakistan since 2004, but there's enormous controversy surrounding the casualty tally. According to Washington and London-based research groups tracking reports of drone strikes here, as many as 3,000 people have been killed as a result, most of whom are labeled militants under a broad U.S. definition, only a few dozen of which have been identified as militant leaders. The problem is that no one cares if nobody is killed. And by nobody, I mean a person who is a nobody, a person who is probably just living in that area, has no money, no education, no, no representation. So Akbar launched his own campaign, a legal one, to represent local families who suffered civilian casualties in the strikes. 
He's now filed lawsuits in Pakistani courts suing former U.S. intelligence officials for carrying out the drone program and the government of Pakistan for failing to stop them. It's incredibly difficult to get any kind of physical evidence from the remote parts of the country where these drone strikes typically occur. But these, what are believed to be fragments of actual Hellfire missiles, were smuggled into Islamabad from those tribal areas. Akbar says the pieces were collected from drone strike sites, and he's using the serial numbers to confirm their make and manufacturers. But to gain access into the far-flung reaches of Pakistan, he partnered with Noor Ben Am, a journalist and father of six, born and raised in North Waziristan. After growing frustrated with the lack of ground reporting from the region, Baram says he committed himself to documenting the devastation. He's gathered photos and testimonies from dozens of strike sites and has personally witnessed 10 drone attacks in and around his own town of Miramshah. There's Al-Qaeda, Taliban, and America. They're fighting each other. The Taliban say you're killing our soldiers, we'll kill yours. I try not to get involved in these issues. If there's even one child killed in the drone strike, it's a tragedy. And across Pakistan, anger is growing. At this anti-drone rally in Miramshah, hundreds of men gather to listen to the leader of this conservative religious group as he rails against what he calls U.S. imperialism and their drone strikes inside Pakistan. Baram worries the U.S. campaign to kill terrorists will actually end up creating more. When people are out there picking up body parts after a drone strike, I think it would be very easy to convince those people to fight against America. Maram and Akbar have filed 13 lawsuits so far representing 71 families of civilians killed and say they'll continue to fight their battle in the courtroom. Amna Nawaz, NBC News, Islamabad. Joining us tonight for the interview is NBC's Pakistan Bureau Chief, Amna Nawaz. Amna, it's great to see you here. Thank you for being here. Congratulations on this. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It is remarkable to see the fragments of the missiles and the guy looking at the serial numbers and trying to track these things down. Is, is this the first that we knew that anything like this was happening? No, of course not. I mean, look, we have known for a while that this was a huge part of this administration's counterterrorism program, sure. certainly in Pakistan, more so than any other country, although it has expanded to other countries in recent years. If you just take a look at the numbers, you see there's been a sharp uptick in the use of these drone strikes in Pakistan over the last decade or so. And we know that the Obama administration in particular relies heavily on these kinds of strikes inside Pakistan. But is this the first time that we knew that Pakistanis were trying to trace the physical evidence of those strikes back to the source of the weaponry for the purposes of getting accountability. This is certainly one of the only efforts that's being made of its kind. Yeah. I mean, this lawyer, uh, Shahzad Akbar, he himself can't go to the regions that he's trying to represent people and where they're from. So he has to rely, as we saw in the report, on the local journalist who's from the area. I mean, this area you mentioned before, it's basically a no-go zone for any outsiders. Independent investigators, human rights watch workers, uh, foreign media, you simply cannot travel freely in the area. So these efforts that he's making, legal efforts, are unique and are the first of their kind. How risky is it for that locally born journalist who you spoke with and who's providing this material, how, how risky is it for him to be not just collecting this footage, but ferrying it to outsiders so that ends up on American national TV tonight. I, I do want to point out the footage that we used was not gotten from the journalists that we profiled in that area. And we work with a number of journalists across the country um, at NBC News. It, I can't stress it enough. Journalists in Pakistan, local journalists, risk their life every day to get to the truth and to get the truth out to the rest of the world. No more so is that true than in North Waziristan, in the tribal areas, and in uh, the KPK area, or the frontier province as we know, the, the borders of Afghanistan. So in order to get this one piece of video out, we actually took a couple of weeks to move the video from place to place until it was safely in the hands of someone that we knew could transmit it back to us. Wow. In terms of of the Obama administration having made a decision to at least publicly admit that we are doing this in Pakistan. And obviously we've known for years that we're doing it, but there, it's been the shell game where the administration doesn't own up to it. John Brennan has now given a speech saying, yes, we're doing it. Mm -hmm. Does that admission convey any hope of further openness in terms of being able to cover it or being able to get further information about it? I don't know that uh, Mr. Brennan's recent admission means they're going to be any more transparent about the program. It remains a classified program. When we approached the CIA for comment about this story, they did decline comment. 
Look, we know that they think this is a program that's working. We know that the top commanders, al-Qaeda, that they're trying to go after, they've been able to knock them off. That leadership of al-Qaeda has basically been decimated as a result of this program. But they are playing a, a bit of a game with this. Privately, anonymously, officials will tout the successes of the program, leak through reports and to sources that they trust in the media, but publicly they will still not own up to the details of much of the program. And finding the other side of that balance, the success versus the risk, finding the risk part of it, finding the downside part of it is almost impossible. And you've given us something that um, is as close to making it possible as I've ever seen. Congratulations on this. It's an incredible work. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Amna Nawaz is a Pakistan bureau chief uh, for NBC. Just incredible. All right.